<laughs> well, I, I had gotten to know King fairly well. Uh, some people on the faculty who were, we would call them activists in ethics and so on. I was not on those front lines, but you, you hung out with them. And so I met regularly with his group. I, was, uh, I had been an interim pastor at a church in Lawndale, two blocks from where he was living when he was here. Uh, I'm not pretending intimacy or influence. I'm not, what was the name of the guy who just lost a job on television for putting himself in the middle of the stories? Uh, I, uh, I'm not a, there, but you were there, but I'm not, but I'm not in the middle of the story. What I'm getting at, but the big breakthrough for me was in the summer of '61. We had five little boys; the oldest was seven, and uh, the Hampton Institute in Virginia, you would know it well, uh, well off, mainly Episcopal churches in Philadelphia, Baltimore, Washington, New York. Every year would subsidize a meeting, five-day meeting of. Uh, pastors of small black churches. I don't know if there's such a thing as a small black church, but I mean, they weren't names I'd known. Uh, all week long, they're, they're, it was a gift to them. And um, that week, it was 61, I did five mornings of lectures. The, the stage was littered with uh, tape recorders and notepads. In the afternoon, King would preach, and nobody Nobody stopped for a recording, and they were jumping and so on. Um, and we lived in the same guest house. And when he would come back from his sessions, uh, there was a low hanging tree there, and he'd put one of the little boys, our youngest, Micah, was a year and a half. He'd put him on the branch and have him fall down and throw him. Well, that's all beside the point, except to say that that autumn, October 31st, we did what Lutheran churches do you have a Reformation festival. And Mr. Jackson, a Tennessean uh, teacher, came to me after church, or after early service, and said, Pastor, you better talk to your son, John. Why? He lies. And I said, well, John's the most honest little kid. He wouldn't never lie. Yes, he claims the last summer he spent a week in a motel with Martin Luther. I said, well, I think we're going to have to tell you there's a difference between Martin Luther and Martin Luther King. Uh, so I don't want to feign intimacy, but it, it was true that the build-up to Selma was, you, you could see it coming. <clears throat> in Greek and biblical and Tilikian terms, it was a kairos. Uh, ordinary time, chronos, and all of a sudden you could sense it's, it's shaping up. A couple of years later, you could see it with the Vietnamese War. Week in, week out, there are people working for better race relations and so on, but everybody could sense this was it, and the bloody Sunday television brought it in those days, people had three or four channels to watch, so the whole nation watches them. And during the filming of A Judgment at Nuremberg, um, they interrupt to tell about the Bloody Sunday images. The next morning, we all got phone calls from King's people, not personally from him. Um, your quota. <laughs> I was supposed to find 15 at Divinity in Christian Century. Chicago, if you get 100, we'll, the elder will fly you a flight down there. I won't go into more detail about that, except to say I made 15 calls and everyone came through. And at Divinity School in, 19, in 2015, celebrating the 50th anniversary, asked what did we learn from it? Um, our ethicists were naturally at it. Uh, we historians weren't. Cutting to the end of it, we were there, we, we were there, well, it was called Turnaround Tuesday which is a nice way of humbling the venture, turnaround Tuesday. We got up to where those guy in the blue were and they turned us around. King led us, led us in prayer. But uh, I, when I wrote a little article about it for the Divinity School later on, what did we learn? I learned that in the crises, you're still wrestling with the things you always wrestle with. We were driven back to the Atlanta airport the evening Jim Reeb was killed, uh, Pastor James Reeb, a Unitarian. Uh, but we were heading back to Atlanta. We, I, had, I had classes the next morning. <laughs> so we were on our way. And Arlie Shart, who was covering it for time, had rented a sizable car and we're in it. And after a long while, he said, by the way, we're driving 35 miles an hour because they said if you go over that, you're going to get arrested in Georgia. <laughs> he said, 
you guys can never get rid of your theology. He said, first, there were two of you were millennial apocalyptic Baptists. You can march for anything. You don't worry. You don't have to report to anybody. If you feel you go, that's it. There's no scripture text about it. You just do it. He said, and then there were uh, Marty and Brower. You're both Lutheran. And you're hung up because um, you thought you were violating Alabama law, but it was a federal law. And there's Romans 13, which every Lutheran has drummed into them, that you don't resist higher authority. So we're, we're sinning. Fortunately for us, King worked out that day with a good federal judge that lifted the injunction. But the, you had that problem. And then he said, and then there's Robert Grant. He was a professor of early Christianity uh, in personal life, a devout, uh, undevout about everything else except Anglicanism. It was kind of the Charles Adams of theology, a funny sense of humor. And uh, it was high church and uh, conservative in every way, but the conscience was reached. So there he was. <laughs> he said, OK, Marty and Brower, they have trouble in Romans 13. Professor Grant, he doesn't even know King George III is dead yet. <laughs> he was still in the empire. Yes, that's, that's a long way of going around to saying that I really do believe that if you're devoted to your scholarship, it can lead into other side. And you can't, art my third I-Z-E word of the day, you can't artificialize it. Um, one year, we were all told to bend, bend our courses so that it would be relevant to. And the Oriental Institute, with whom we worked a great deal, did that. And uh, Hans Guterbach, a great uh, sacrosanct. Sanskrit scholar. Hans Guterbuck, a great Sanskrit scholar, was going to teach a course on the city and stuff. After a couple of weeks, the students came and said, that's a good one. Just be yourself. You really were a good professor when you just taught us the real stuff about that ancient culture. Now you're trying to make it relevant to Chicago in 1963. Uh, forget it. And I think that was it, too. The uh, if you were in that line, as my colleague Alvin Pitcher, uh, Dean Parsons of Rockefeller Chapel, Gibson Winter, they were all writing books about this subject. It was a natural for them, and it grew out of their thing, and their students were studying on it. We were marginal. We were also blessed, you mentioned Vincent Harding, there was a surge of uh, African American students for the first time. Uh, the first African American student at Chicago had been Benjamin Mays in the 1920s and a shaper of the field. And in teaching, we had the great John Hope Franklin in history and thought it good with us along the way. But it was, it was new. Suddenly, you have all these people there who knew things we didn't know. Uh, one of mine was advisees was Jeremiah Wright, who got better known a little later in the Obama campaign. Uh, he'd been on Bill Moyer's program the Friday before it became big news. Moyer said, how did you get into this stuff? Well, uh, my professor, Martin Marty, taught us all this. <laughs> I didn't teach him anything. He said, he was teaching us, you don't just serve your congregation, you serve the city. And he had us all bring a Sunday bulletin from our churches and had us count how many events were just within the premises and how much reached out. So we did it. Well, that's, that's how it was. And Vincent Harding and I were fellow students. He was a brilliant student. But it shows how changes came. Uh, Sidney Mead, my advisor, and I yield to none in admiration for him, said, uh, Mr. Harding, you are a Negro, and uh, I, if I were you, I would avoid a Negro subject. If you write about Negroes, you're going to get typed, and that's your specialty. So he had him write on Lyman Beecher, the Congregational New Englander, <laughs> which Harding did superbly, but not with passion. And in the middle of it all, the Martin Luther King family called him to work with their foundation, maybe to head it and so on. And he put in a few years there, not pleasant years. He didn't like the way it was done. But he came back to finish his doctorate. So uh, I, I was in on his dissertation, but I can't take credit for him except being a, a campus buddy. <laughs>